Deadpool too, bro. <laughs> Come on. I just have two questions. Is dubstep still a thing? <laughs> dubstep is lame. You I, need to Google I, I only, it. I only yeah. watched that movie once. Ah. So. Well. And that's... men talk. That's like zero <laughs> times. No, I watched it. Yeah. No, I'm a Deadpool fan. Oh, yeah. No, no. You, you, you only watched it once. You're not a Deadpool fan. Oh, my God. <laughs> half Deadpool. Yeah. It wasn't as good as I was hoping. I had, I had high expectations. I was you're like, like oh. adjacent. You're a fan adjacent. You're guilty by association. Yes. You're not, not the quite. criminal. Yeah. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> Let's talk about mental health. Yeah. I just That's go, a great transition. I want to go lay down. Yeah. <laughs> Are you feeling depressed? Oh, man. I am now. Yeah. My feeling got hurt. Well, that's oh. that's exactly what forced debriefing does to folks. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you weren't fucked up until you came into my office, and now you are. <laughs> oh, um, I do curse a lot. Okay, how are you? right out of the gate, man. Boom, that's, got her. Yeah. Uh, how are you guys with? That? Oh, that's just it's. It is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We I try. Mean, we try to keep it to a minimum. We, yeah, we, yeah. we try to, you know, not ever use. Any type of that language, because we're, we're nice and you know, <laughs> trying to be professional. Yeah, I professional. got my one shot out of the room. I got my new chair, just trying to get it broken. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, this is nice. So the, the last chair he had, every time he moved, it squeaked. It sounded yeah. like a 1940s bed. Yeah, it, it was terrible, and it wouldn't let you set up straight. Really, like as soon as you sat in it, you're like. Mm. Interviewing somebody while you're laying yeah. back. <laughs> Don't mind me. I am trying to make eye contact. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I told a couple of people just throughout my day today what I was doing, that I was coming to the podcast, and I couldn't remember the name of it. And all three of them knew exactly what it was. You guys are popular. Awesome. Yeah. Good. I'm not pulling your leg. I've got three listeners. <laughs> <laughs> now we got four because I talked, I talked to one yesterday. I was working overtime. Oh, well, there you on go. A, on a slower ambulance, and we were busy. Nice. So, but well, I hear a lot of the same things. The lighting. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's doing the best we can with. Oh yeah. With what yeah. we got. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, this is this is an extra bedroom. Yeah. And then throw a <laughs> pandemic on top of yeah. your ability to get anything done. Just, yeah. yeah. And you can't buy wood anymore because I can't afford it. Yeah. I'm a public seriously. Servant. I don't make it. That's why I'm working overtime. <laughs> well, I can buy wood. <laughs> gonna have to back start into it. mental health. Yeah. yeah. We can we can go there. Start an illegal logging operation. <laughs> I'm going to cut my neighbor's tree down. He doesn't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Christmas. What is going on out here? Oh, oh it's Chevy just Chase the that. neighbors. Yeah. Don't worry about it. We have him. to build a studio. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll put oh, you on the podcast. I did buy a table saw. Sweet. I'm going to actually need that. Yep. It was, it was on sale. It's not the one I wanted. Yeah. But it was a good price. I was like, I can't say no. Yeah. Because we'll, my wife's been on me about getting one. We'll, yeah. We'll talk after the podcast. I got to build something. So. <laughs> Man. So the other day I posted a, a meme on Facebook. This is every time my wife says I have an idea, it's going to cost me uh, money and I got to build something. I I can corroborate <laughs> right that there. as right fact. There. It's true. <laughs> you make your husband do a lot of that That's stuff? the only time I communicate <laughs> with him is when I need to. I'm just joking. I love no. my husband. <laughs> So like like my son's room because he he's he pretty much moved out. She wants to put a different floor in now. Take yeah, the carpet out, put yeah. the floor in because it's her craft room. Yeah. But she bought a whole bunch of shiplap, and I'm like, this is like eight hours of work for me. That's it's easy peasy. I'm on your wife's yeah. side here. <laughs> shiplap, you can do so that. I, so I held up the first one. So I had the door frame, and I was like, oh, you should just right up here, and it sits like this. The yeah. door frame's not straight at all. <laughs> I was like. And it's not one I put in either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good good yeah. point with like, shiplap. Oh. So now I got to make a long angled cut and figure out the angle. And I will say, during this pandemic, we moved into a new house that that we had a contractor for with with the major structural renovations. But renovating during the pandemic <laughs> has saved our marriage a couple of times because it gives you <laughs> something to do and focus on. And you guys don't fight about it. Well, we do, okay. but it's still so, something to do. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is I have a normal marriage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> very healthy, very healthy. My husband's not in medicine at all. He's actually stay at home right now. He's a farmer, small town. So oh. he has got a different perspective of the pandemic than I do, but it's nice to have an outsider. Your wife, she's in medicine or no? Mm -hmm. Oh, she works for a company that does like, so like the automatic arms we run. Yeah. Her, her company is the one that takes them. So she manages that nice. whole that whole sit center. So yeah, yeah. I keep telling them like, Hey, if the, you guys can cancel us, it's not, a, it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I guess the deal is like their policy that they can't cancel us, but the, the owner can. 
So like, what if the owner tells you, no, we can't do it? I'm like, but it's the owner. They've got all the passwords. No, we can't do it. That's an, that's a, <laughs> that makes sense for a policy, it, right? It does. I get it. No I understand. I'm not mad at her. Yeah. I'll, I'll text her sometime. I'm like, hey, can you cancel us? <laughs> <laughs> I was studying. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're studying. Yeah. I was studying. Yeah. <laughs> everybody knows what that means. Yeah. <laughs> not everybody. Yeah. You're listening to this podcast. You're yeah. studying. They Free should. online education there. Yeah. And with that, welcome to the Washdown Podcast. All right. I'm your host, Jeremy Green. With me, my co-host, Chris Nelson. And today we are talking to Dr. Erica Carney. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome for you to be yeah. here. It I look a, forward to it. It is a JFD, by the way. Yes. It's a Jim Free Day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Poor James. <laughs> Poor James. Unfortunately, he, he's... He is still with us on Earth. Yes. He's just yeah. doing a different job right now. <laughs> yeah. He's being fancy with new ambulances. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not touching Let's that dive one. Dive in. Yeah. <laughs> dive in. So, you ever seen her sweatshirt that she has? That she's she's posted pictures of it. The mental health one. Oh yeah. I was hoping you were going to wear that. I really. Oh, I meant yeah. to tell. I meant to tell James to tell you, or I, was, I meant to text you myself, and I didn't do it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. No. I'll, I'll let her tell you it, what it says. It literally just says "Mental health is health." That's the sweatshirt. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Very apropos. Yes. Yes. I should have <laughs> worn it today. Yeah. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. Let's just dive right in. Yeah. So what made you want to get into medicine? I That is the common question, right? What came yeah. first, the chicken or the egg? Uh -huh. And I think you guys will be very similar to me in the sense that instead of being intimidated by any type of chaos, I was more attracted to it. I wanted to, but in the sense I wanted to get into it, but know what I was doing so I could help calm down the chaos instead of contribute to the chaos. So um, I I don't know, you know, before I was in medicine, I, I worked in the food industry. So I, I don't necessarily know if I was destined to be a physician from day one, but it was definitely along the lines of anytime you see a car accident or a shooting or a big fight, the ability to be able to help in that situation was always very strong. And so in my childhood, my parents moved us from the inner city of Kansas City down to a small town called Drexel, Missouri. Um, we kind of had, it's an interesting freedom when you're in a small town because the sky is kind of the limit. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to get done what you want to get done. So if I wanted to go to school, if I wanted to be on a sports team, it was something that was easier to do in a small town versus the inner city. And I got this wild hair when I was 17, 18 years old. I'm still in the small town. Hey, I want to apply to medical school. No one in my family's in medicine. I'm, I'm still not really sure where that came from. I thought I was going to do psychiatry, which is very similar to ER and EMS, right? Mm, <laughs> I yeah. guess. Um, and so I actually, Drexel is about an hour south of the city here. So I had heard of this six-year program that was combined BAMD. So these young kids, you come straight out of high school and you go straight into medical school where it's six years year round and then you graduate as a physician with your MD. And so I, I put in my application and I didn't hear anything. And so I'm applying for other colleges because I'm at a small town. I'm not expecting to get accepted by any means, you know. And so I, I make a phone call to the School of Medicine and they tell me, oh, wow, we've actually been communicating with you, but we must have the wrong contact information. Your, your interview is actually tomorrow. So I thought, oh, <laughs> crap, you know, <laughs> here I'm 17, 18 years old and telling my parents, hey, we got to we gotta we go gotta to go. the city. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get interviewed. And so we, we did the interview and it's interesting to me, all of these individuals who grew up in medicine and how their lifestyle was versus my lifestyle just not growing up in it at all um 
and how they had already taken the MCAT and been been very prepared. You know, I'm I was smart. I was valedictorian. I, I did medical school. Don't get me wrong, but I definitely didn't have the same CV I felt as as some of these other applicants. So we go into the interview, and the guy I used to be a candy striper at a small town hospital, which is in the neighboring town, and he's like, "Hey, what interesting stories do you have from there?" And I'm like, "I actually don't have any interesting <laughs> stories. I I helped file paperwork, and I'm not going to make something up." Do they still have? Candy stripers, or is that I think it's, the past? I think it's I think it's a t- a term that has changed, so it's okay. it's probably more just volunteer now. Oh, okay, that, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, I still, uh, I still like the term candy yeah. striper though. So he's he's kind of trying to dig. He's like, well, what about what about medicine? And so I was talking about when I was a babysitter, I I had a cat have a seizure. <laughs> I can't kind of take you through that. <laughs> so we end up driving home from this thing, and I'm thinking, man, we I bombed it. You know, I, I talked about a cat having a seizure. I don't have the same CV. Um, but there was different attributes that I guess they, they thought were quite effective. I'm obviously a bubbly person. It's easy for me to interact with people and I, I don't really see much as, as a challenge. I do see challenges, but instead of seeing them as blockades, there's just an innate desire to figure out how to progress past that blockade. And so those were all, all things that they had kind of commented on. And then I got into the medical school here. And then I thought for a long time I would do just primary medicine, kind of what we were joking about earlier, and then psychiatry. My dad worked in the mental health field, more on the social work and business side for years. And I I saw the sickest of the sick when it came to um, mental illness and, and just within our family and friends and the lifestyle, how we grew up, I was I was not a stranger to it. And so I thought that's where I was going to go. And then I realized every time I worked a shift in the ER, when I left, I felt like I needed to call somebody like, wow, that, that story that was just on the news, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's what we treated. That's what we did. But more importantly, it started to ingrain in me the confidence to help kind of control that chaos. It was just getting right into the middle of that. And then I thought I knew I wanted to subspecialize. I thought I was going to do disaster response because disaster response is a fellowship, just like EMS physician fellowship. And one of my mentors, there's an EMS physician, um, took me to the side at the same time the Joplin tornado had happened. My twin had graduated from undergrad there in Joplin, but she was living in Australia at the time with her schools. Um, and so I, I really wanted to get down to Joplin. I'm an ER doc. I want to help. And I thought I was going to do it through this disaster response pathway, but in disaster response, it takes at least 12 to 24 hours to deploy as we all know. And so the initial acute injuries are no longer there by the time you go in 12 to 24 hours later. And so a small group of us ER docs and a couple of the surgeons went down to Joplin and, and, um, there was fire EMS agencies there. And then this EMS mentor of mine, just kind of talking about this, this is really what EMS exists for is, is boots on the ground within seconds. This is where you need to be. And then throughout the years, I kind of learned the administrative role of it as well, on top of kind of that sexy clinical response. The majority of my job is not sexy. The majority of my job is administrative and policies and procedures but the ability to reach far beyond one hospital. So as an ER doc, I've got my one hospital, my one department. As an EMS doc, I literally deal, as you guys know, with every single hospital, every single agency, every single health department. So like the Super Bowl parade is a great example, or the, the pandemic, the virus. So my natural ability to kind of connect with people, that networking skill, um, on top of that chaos that we were kind of talking about, it really just just plummeted me into EMS. And then being from from here, fire EMS was was the path because that's what I've kind of grown up around was was fire. So I kind of dipped my toes in helicopter EMS and private EMS and some hospital base just to know a little bit about all of them. But it always came down to the camaraderie and the station life of, of fire EMS where when we talk about mental health and and the ability to debrief and camaraderie all of it it all to me kind of pointed back towards that fire ems so after my fellowship one of my bosses recruited me back to kansas city um knowing that this is kind of where my family's from this is where i want to end up long term and then the rest is history 
So I've been the medical director for the past three years now, but before that I, w I was the associate. And then I'm also, I've, I've got many hats that I, I won't go into just in regards to agencies and names, but the ability to do almost anything. You, you get a 911 call, you respond, it could be the mayor's house. You get a 911 call and you respond, it could be the homeless camp. You know, it's literally everything within a day. Mm -hmm. And then after these events, I always would kind of um, joke or kind of laugh. You know, that's how I let my stress off. And I found that the same personalities were those in fire EMS. You would go see something kind of horrible and then you'd be like, you want to go grab a bite tea? Okay. You know, and then you kind of pick on each other and, mm -hmm. and then you're kind of on to the next. Not to say you're not processing what you just went through, but you just obviously process it different with that type of personality than somebody who's going to perseverate on it or, or focus on it or bring it up at the wrong time, what, what we were kind of talking about earlier. So I'll pause there. You can't use big words like that. Perseverate? Or, or, or firefighters. That's when you just focus <laughs> on something so hard. <laughs> yeah. Ruminate. Yes. Stop yes. it. Marinate. <laughs> Marinate. Yes. Yes. You understand that. It's a plethora of words <laughs> I don't know. That's a big word, too. <laughs> That's always been my favorite word since I was a little kid. Mm. And, and you saw the three amigos, didn't you? <laughs> I love the three amigos. What is a plethora? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that from my, uh, from my grandfather, my dad's dad. That's good. Yeah. He, was, he was a teacher at one time. And the one professor. word you <laughs> That's, the, one, that's the, one, the biggest memory I have. I mean, I, he's still around, but it was, that's one of the earliest memories I have of him. Yeah, that's mm. cool. That's plethora. fantastic. But it's a great word. That's a good well, word. It is a great <laughs> word. It's one I can pronounce. This is the exact example I was getting at. You know, <laughs> you perseverate on plethora. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> no, I think, and you know, I, I know you showed up on calls and stuff, and it's it's great to to, ha to have you show up on these calls. And, you know, in case we need, and you're not you're not so much doing that to watch over us, but making sure we're okay. And yeah, that was a and big. You're there to kind of help goal. too if, if we need it. Yeah. So. Something Historically, a physician on the scene has been, I will use generalized statements, but at, at least for our area of the world, historically, an EMS physician on scene has been negative. You've got somebody who might not have the same skill set or experience mm -hmm. who will show up on scene and kind of start demanding or, or telling you how to do your job when they're coming from a whole different world. And so... When the transition happened a few years ago, that was my, I only have one chief oversight medic on the, on the city side, but my one point in conversation with her is, I, I know you've been a medic for so many years. Our goal is not to play medic on scene though. Our goal is to truly play medical oversight. And so sometimes medical oversight is us getting on our hands and knees doing chest compressions mm -hmm. or picking up the monitor or helping with the cot. Just, and just asking you guys okay that's, yeah sometimes yeah. that's just enough like yeah we're good yeah you know, do you but, guys need anything you know because even those yeah. simple calls that or those calls that came out that we think are going to be simple yeah can turn south real quick yeah yeah and sometimes it's nice to know you have that person over your shoulder if you need them yeah and the role had but, to be redefined as non-disciplinary too yeah. my my goal in showing up on scene is not to catch you in something or to fire you it's literally to support you hey i've been there i'm i'm ems i'm pre-hospital i know that this can be a mess what can i do to help support you for this patient to make mm -hmm. that successful so sometimes we're good at that sometimes not as good but it's it's a goal of ours to continue to work towards so yeah so I, I, I like it. Yeah. yeah. Of, course, of course, I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just well, that, that whole Kansas City carry thing we yeah. talked about. A humble brag there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, that's a, I think that's an aspect of leadership too, though, that you come in and you're setting your people up for success of, hey, we're here. We'll do whatever needs to be done to support you to get this done. Yeah. Yeah. So. And there's always teachable moments too that where yeah. you know you're going to see something different than we see it because of the education and experience. Yeah. So we're like, hey, did you see this? No. Yeah. And then then you explain why, and that next time we catch it. Yeah. Part of the maturation in in the process in the position is also acknowledging when that presence isn't necessary, or you know that comment or whatever other tidbit I come up with isn't necessary, but. Um, that, that all comes with experience. And I, I do strongly believe that most folks, when we show up on scene, it's been extremely receptive. It's a warm, 
welcoming environment. I think a lot of that had to do with me working in the ER for so many years prior, Mm -hmm. because a lot of folks already knew me on on the hospital side, you know. Um, And so whenever I got out into the field in this part of the world, um, having a face that they had recognized, I I think Mm -hmm. made a big difference. And I'm from here. I know the history here. I know, um, know the streets here. I know which which parts of town have have which um you know issues calls exactly <laughs> certain calls associated with them so anyways yeah yeah so mental health mental health <laughs> <laughs> on to the hot button yeah topic issue um and we were talking about before about burnout yeah you know and so what is like your process of seeing that yeah. and steps that we're trying to take to kind of mitigate it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I do believe a big portion of burnout in public safety and fire EMS is the redefinition of what that stressor is. Because again, what we historically have as as white shirts or um, authorities, what we have considered in regards to critical incidents or things that could exacerbate burnout that is not actually the issues that that our crews are being uh, bothered with daily depending on what the issues are and so the redefinition of what is stress and what is burnout over the past three to five years within ems in general has been so important So historically, we defined everything as a critical incident, and it had to meet certain parameters for us to do critical incident stress debriefing. So that's the line of duty death, the uh, partner injured or sick, kind of what we were talking about. It had to be some of these major events. And then historically, so not necessarily here, just around the world in EMS, historically what we would do is we would send people home. So they have this exposure And then the folks that they live with on a daily basis in the stations, they're no longer around because now we're saying, hey, you've witnessed this, go home. And then you would get kind of, um, I'll just say a lack of communication for that week or three weeks. And then all of a sudden you have to go into the sterile clinic or environment and somebody comes at you with a white coat and they've never responded to the same type of scene that they're then tasked with asking you about. And so the vernacular really has changed from critical incident stress debriefing to more of this resilience type of of discussion, resiliency and resilience. The thing about resilience is it's preventative. So it's looking at personnel as humans um, instead of cogs in, in the wheel. And, you know, we do PM, we do maintenance on all of our apparatuses, but we don't do that with our personnel. We don't do that with our humans. And so a critical incident stress debriefing was truly more reactive. How much fixing can you do by the time you're reacting? Something bad has already happened. And if you already have weak parts of the agency and then it's stressed, then obviously you see it's really hard to bounce back from. Whereas resilience is more about that preventative type of, of mental health. And I'll tell you, I've, I've looked at all of the science of mental health and burnout when it comes to pre-hospital EMS, that's, that's my passion. And what the studies show us is that public safety is at a, a enormously large risk of burnout suicide, um, drinking, drugs. It is, it is the, one of the highest professions you can go into that predictably will lead to that outcome. We, we've just noticed this over the years. If you go into EMS, you're at a higher risk of burnout, suicide, drug abuse, alcohol. Um, so did the career create that? Did the personalities that were more drawn to that have that, that type of predisposition? It's, it's hard to say. But when you're starting to look at prevention as protective against burnout, it really does come down to very basic measures, sleep, nutrition, uh, time off, time with your family, some type of purpose outside of your work, and some type of spiritual connection, whether that be meditation or church or something like that, some type of greater good, some type of connection. And so for years, we have thrown all of these things at 
burnout, all of these things, medications, courses, PowerPoints. And what we found is none of them work. Well, some of them work and some of them do have their place, but it's really more about how healthy are humans at the start on day one from there. And so when you start focusing on what you can do to truly prevent burnout, it's not magical. It's not this magic pill I give somebody. It's just a redefinition of how you see stress and how you prevent yourself from being burned out from that stress. One other thing I do want to highlight is burnout is a step beyond exhaustion. We're all exhausted. We're in a pandemic. We're parents. Mm -hmm. We're full time. You know, we've got part time jobs on top of that. Burnout is when you no longer care, though. That's when that exhaustion's just gone, and you are just you are just functioning. And the burnout rate in EMS personnel is extremely high. It's extremely high, top to bottom. It doesn't matter if you're five years in or 50 years in. The burnout element, if you've been public safety or pre-hospital, is is always something that you have to ac acknowledge. So I'll pause there for any questions or kind of. Yeah, I, well, I kind of mentioned it the other day. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Tanya Glenn um, down in Texas. Yep. So I just read yeah. one of her books, Code 4, and yeah. she talks about like the stages of the career, how mm -hmm. you come in and it's like the age of innocence and you're like, woohoo, yes. I'm a fireman <laughs> uh -huh. or I'm uh -huh. a medic or whatever. And then you get to that end of innocence stage yeah. about five years in or so mm -hmm. where, crap, this sucks. Everything's yeah. terrible. And then you know, you kind of come out of it and mm -hmm. you have the wisdom stage is the last part of your career. Yeah. And I mean, it makes perfect sense because that I could tell you exactly. My career took that exact yeah. trajectory because yeah. mm -hmm. right about that five to seven year mark was, man, this sucks. I really don't want to go to work today. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, and then I would get a little better and then a little worse, a little yeah. better, a little worse. And then really bad. And yeah. And yeah, so now we have a podcast. Flow. The flow <laughs> of your career. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I did the same thing. And I mean, I, it, with your definition, I'd definitely say I burned out. Yeah. Yeah. And then just not working as a medic, not working overtime, doing things. I'm getting to that, trying to get to woodworking, working yeah. on the house. That all helped. And then I don't, the, the compassion's back yeah. and, and when that, you, but. when you think about it, were you truly well rested? Were oh, no. you no. No. <laughs> sleep, eating sleep good was, nutrition? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And I'm I'm not saying that that simplifies the issues of, no, of mental part of health and, yeah. and EMS. Like you said before, it's multifactorial. <laughs> what was that? What was that, that, that might be better than plethora. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I am not above so, walking out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going to go? It's your house. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back upstairs and keep we'll watching stay. Westworld. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are welcome. So, but no, it's like you said, it's, there are a lot of contributing factors yeah. to what leads you down that road and being proactive, Yeah. If, you know, with the whole resilience thing, yeah. it's, you have to start early yeah. because the more that you're able to basically put in the bank, yeah. That's that more that you can take. And if you, you know, you have that bad call or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be, it's okay. All right. Here's just what I need to do. Yeah. I need to take a minute for myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, okay. I get on. frequently, I get calls from providers who have known me over the years who have had that bad call that you're kind of talking about. And they'll talk to me. Hey, Dr. Carney. I, I just didn't know who to reach out to, so I wanted to reach out and see if you could help me. And my first question is always, when is the last time you've slept? And then after that, my next question is, when's the last time you've had a good home-cooked meal? And then we kind of work our way. And so you're having issues sleeping? Okay, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the different options. What I'm going to do is I'm going to help. We're going to talk through what would work best for you. And then after you get consistent sleep for at least a night, then you call me back and, mm -hmm. and let's try it again. And then the next step again, usually after, because it's usually sleep deprivation surrounding these issues because mm -hmm. you're, you're just kind of worked up, you're revved up. So if we can kind of get some forced sleep in there through safe, safe ways, you know, um, it, it does help kind of clear your mind to help process. And then the next step again is when's the last time you ate something? Cause nausea is a huge component of depression and everything else. Okay. So you're, you're just kind of snacking on some crackers. That's probably not good enough nutrition. What can we do that would really get you fed right now? Think of any, any, 
any instance in your life, you are uh, post nights, you just worked the entire night and then you go and your, um, your tire blows or something. That is a way different situation than if you're well rested and well fed and then your tire blows. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like absolutely. just your ability to even process what is going on because the majority of folks haven't slept. Um, now there are situations that take much more than sleep and eating, mind you, which, which you guys all know. Um, and the interesting thing about the science is it's cumulative. So when you think of people who are the most affected by burnout or depression, suicidality, these are all published studies on you guys, on you and your people. Um, it's, it's again, cumulative. It's the hours worked. So this is captain level, BC level, um, deputy chief level. This is people who have been in the business for years and years. And that is the highest predictor of, of burnout is how many years you've been in, in this field. Well, it's, I read one of those, I actually wrote a paper on it for yeah. my classes and we were, remember what I said was 15 to 24% more likely to commit suicide than the general public. And oh, that was just in the people they studied. It's higher now. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and this study was probably five, five years yep. old that I found, yep. but it was just showing that, you know, cause I, I did a research paper on yeah. mental health and first responders. Yeah. And it was, that was just astounding. Yeah. Well, that number. It, that's exactly like the analogy. <clears throat> so, I mean, you could even talk about you know, the, what are the ECT mm -hmm. that football players have, yeah, you know, yeah. it's the accumulation of the hits uh -huh, and all this uh -huh. stuff. And then it doesn't really manifest itself until later on in yeah. life. Right. It's the same thing of you see all of this trauma, see all yeah. of this stuff. You've got your personal stuff. The, mm -hmm. I mean, the yep. world's not just hunky dory out here when you're at home, there's things that happen too. Yeah. And that all gets put in. And yeah. the kind of analogy that I use is, you have a, basically a cardboard box in your head. Everybody thinks it's a steel vault. Yeah. It is not a steel vault. It is a leaky, wet cardboard box. <laughs> That's true. That you just keep piling crap yeah. in. Well, it's not going to stay there. Yeah, yeah. And eventually, at some point, it's going to overflow. Yeah. And then whenever it does, it's, it'll start leaking out at yeah. first. Yeah. And it's going to affect this aspect of your life and this back to, mm -hmm. aspect of your life. For guys like us... Mm -hmm the job will be the last thing that it affects. Yep. But when it does, yep. and, oh boy. And at that point, when it, when it comes to health and resiliency, it's way too late. Oh yeah. You know, there's, there's not much any specialist can do at, at that point. There are certain things that can be done. I don't want to sound um, overly dramatic with it, but when we see somebody reach that point, mm -hmm. we are so behind the eight ball mm -hmm. with how to, to help, that individual, that human being. So you've got this personality of people who are attracted to chaos, you know, attracted to tones dropping any of the hour, any hours of the night. If, if it is the calls in the call nature that you really like, you know, that adrenaline rush. So there's that acute stress that's actually beneficial. It gets you up and going. It's the fight or flight. And then there's that chronic stress that you talk about with the family life or administrative issues or infrastructure issues, bureaucracy, politics, just you name it. Mm -hmm. Poor pay, you know. Um, and so the chronic stress has been the biggest issue of perpetuating burnout, that chronic mismanagement of your stress. Because again, those calls, that's kind of what you sign up for. That's what you're here for. You, you can do a little bit of those acute stressful situations and have a great, great life in this specialty, but to not have any lesson or defense mechanism against the chronic daily stressors that are known to burn you out, those are the individuals that we deal with as a whole because it's not something you teach in medic school. It's not something you teach in EMT school. We might touch on it a little bit at the academy. And again, in station life, you kind of might touch touch on it a little bit. And there's certain people who do it better. So there's certain stations that are gonna have great debriefing such sessions and hot wash. But as a whole, EMS is just not prepared to handle that chronic stress, hence the high burnout and the suicidality. And when when you look at these studies, the, the interesting thing, so all of the recent studies on burnout and mental health and EMS are done by National Registry, so NREMT. 
And the interesting thing about the respondents is these are the cream of the crop folks. This is somebody who's up to speed with their state credentialing, state licensure, plus their national registry. And I'm responding to a survey, an unsolicited survey. You know, the majority of our employees, we can't get them to read their emails. So this, this, the group that's being studied here. That was directed you know at you. What I'm saying? That was directed at you. I read my email. I do. I, do. I, I really read do. My email every year around promotion. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and that's it. And and so you've got you know the majority of people responding to these surveys. I'm glad there are studies that are starting to come out on it. But again, it's a different population even. It's the cream of the crop paramedic who's got every certification licensure up to snuff. So in their free time, they can contribute to a study. And those results still have the astronomically high burnout rates mm -hmm. and suicidality. And so if you take that study and you apply it to more of a generalized urban inner city department where we have every end of the spectrum, our burnout's going to be even higher. Our, our risk of suicidal behavior, gambling, drinking, drugs, it's, it's, it's obviously going to be higher than any of these studies is, is what yeah. I'm getting at. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, even read, even read the studies that I read because I read like multiple through the yeah the school website that you yeah. they were all peer review, peer reviewed and all that they were good I enjoyed them yeah but I learned a lot of stuff and it made me go shit yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. he cursed that time not yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't say the bad one though oh gotcha <laughs> you, you still got me beat <laughs> but you know, but it makes you fill yeah, sticks <laughs> <laughs> but it make reading them, it makes you really think about okay so this is a possibility even for for all of us in the field how do I combat that yeah how do, how do i take care of myself so i can help yeah the, guy, the person next to me that way it doesn't happen to them and then yeah. there was in a lot of the studies that i read it broke it, it broke it down to who they studied and 95 percent was white males but then you look at all these departments you're like there's no departments yeah like that like what, what about the women yeah what about the african-americans the mm -hmm. mexicans mm -hmm. the asians you know and what about you know there's other issues yeah. that we have today with yeah you know, plus, you, know, you got identity plus you got, a pandemic plus let's a pandemic. throw that on there then you, you throw know, in religions just, yeah, different religions yeah. it changes it for religion and, the, and all exactly these people right. come in yeah. and you have them all right here in the fire department mm -hmm. shoulder to shoulder you know and, and doing the same job yeah. and, and we'll handle it different they're, poor, they're poorly prepared just just yeah. in general all of us are you know in general too. and they're study but the study that's what made me mad about yeah. the study was it's like yeah you need to broaden that study yeah, out yep. to include all these people that make up yeah. fire departments and EMS. Yeah. And well, versus and even before then, all of the studies were on, on my, um, coworkers, on physicians, physicians and nurses. You can't compare a physician lifestyle to a fire EMS lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. You probably could in some certain instances, but as a whole, the amount of resources and support I have as a physician is way more historically speaking than somebody who's who's in a fire station in an inner city um, and so if if the percentage of burnout in the physician side is that high and tr trying to talk about generalization of those results i mean there's there's many things against against folks going into ems so what we found in the pandemic right now is is that exact statement coming to fruition where EMS is decreasing across the board. A lot of people are choosing other lifestyles. Um, I, for me personally, and I'm sure for you guys as well, that's not the answer. The answer is not necessarily to leave this entire passion behind or this life behind. I do think one of the most frustrating things about the studies though, is again, the answers are, they're not magical and they're not sexy. It's not like bring in this um, specialist from, you know, uh, like some type of, of psychologist or whatever, whatever it may be. I, I do highly recommend counseling and psychology. So that's a bad example. <laughs> uh, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. There's yeah. no magic pill. That There's we no can magic just fix. Exactly. There. There's no magic button or answer. Yeah. And in fact, it does the opposite. It highlights the issues, mm -hmm. the issues that are the hardest to change. It mm -hmm. highlights infrastructure issues, bureaucracy issues, political issues pay issues pay is a big issue with with lack of pay i should say is a big issue um cultural issues cultural mm -hmm. issues uh, traditions yeah all yeah that. and there's certain traditions that you and i love right oh absolutely. I, I love just going and 
you know, you kind of pick on each other and, oh. and get each other going. Like there's that component that's healthy and the camaraderie is healthy, but then there's the other component of it that's certainly not, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole locker room talk or, or whatever term you want to put on it. And so when we look at this, when you're trying to sell this and budget for it, prevention and, and resiliency and health, again, because it's not that sexy and it's more simplified, it's about allowing humans to be healthy, healthy humans in your agency. Um, it's, it's hard to budget and make time for that as an administrative person in charge. Mm -hmm. Right. Does well, that make sense? Yeah. And it's hard yeah, to get makes... us to sit down and... It, like if you came in to a station, like, hey, guys, I want to talk about your mental health today. You're going to get a lot. <laughs> no, yeah. no, we're not doing that. Well, you know, that's, I mean, it's just because that's yeah. personality type. Yeah. yeah. Nobody wants that's to a good point. Yeah. A, a lot of it is like, you know, like you touched on with it's a budget thing yeah. of, you know, OK, the bean counters, they're going to look <laughs> at, OK, this program is going to cost us this much mm -hmm. money and this and blah, 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 blah. And that's all they look they're looking at is the bottom line. Yeah. What they don't look at is, okay, yes, this project will cost, let's just use an even number of $5,000, Yeah. right? How much does it train or cost to train a new person yeah. to come on the fire department? Okay. Cause we just lost seven yep. guys Yep. or however many guys to either leaving to go to a different job because yep. they were burned out. We lost people to suicide, yep. whatever. Yep. Okay. If we would have spent this 5,000. How many of those guys would we still have? Yeah. Have we been able to retain that some of them may have still been alive yeah. just with $5,000? Yeah. Yeah. And instead of now we're spending $60,000 yeah. to try to replace, we can't replace all of them because we don't have that much money, yeah. but we're going to try to replace those seven with two Yeah. who in a few years are going to be in that same exact position. Yep, you're exactly right. It's got it. And the change has to occur top down and from the bottom up. I mean, it, it's got to be a true... But to be free to make changes to better your life, there also has to be corresponding agency changes as well that allows you to, to focus on a healthier lifestyle. Um, so you look at, let's just talk about food. Food and... I love food. Yeah, I love food too, right? You know, you know I'm the fat guy here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I love it more than you guys. Well, I love it. I do too. But if you look at the lifestyle of EMS or fire EMS um, and you're eating on the go mm -hmm. and say you're at one of the busy stations, let's just say a 12 hour shift because 24 as we know is, is falling out of favor. But in that shift, the only time you get to eat is quick fast food or um, the only time you get a pee, right, mm -hmm. is, is quick trip or whatever it may be your nutritional value and your ability to have a healthy body is already depleted. And here we've got a lifestyle of that, that we have to try to combat. Mm -hmm. So even though it's relatively simple, it's also not simple too. Right. So obviously you have some stations that buy in and I've eaten some of the best food at stations, mm -hmm. which is why I actually <laughs> why chose fire buy. EMS. <laughs> That's the answer of it. It's the food. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, we do but, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or let's take physical health. So again, these are very simple answers, like good nutrition. The next one's physical health. And you're run ragged after a 12-hour shift, because again, I'm not talking about 24s right now. You're not going to feel like working out, right? Um, you're not going to feel, uh, and then if the, the nutrition with that is poor, you're not going to have that type of energy to feel like working out. And then if you even talk about introducing physical exams again or not or fit for duty, that also has implications as well. Because if I go to a station that hasn't had fit for duty for years and then I enforce it, there's also job loss associated with, with that part as well. So that's, that's the tough part, I think, about the mental health is there are some easier answers that are protective, but when you mix them into our world or our environment, they're just not as easy as, as you would think they would be. So how do you make an entire agency change to where everybody can eat healthy and feel well rested and be physically fit and focus on prevention? And there's different ways that different agencies have approached that over the years, specifically more recently over the years. 
But again, let's talk about reception of that. Yeah. You take my fried food away from me, I'm going to be yes, very angry. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> if I, as a short, blonde, loud Sorry. female, come into your station and I ask you, hey, guys, how are you doing? You doing okay? <laughs> you know, and I kind of pat you on the shoulder. It's not the typical, you're not going to sell anybody on that, hey, this is this is going to change my life because some short, loud, blonde lady who told me she was a doctor came in and asked me how I was. And so it is also kind of a culture shift and change within our entire career, mm -hmm. which is hard to take on. Yeah. And it's a, that's a worldwide culture change yeah. too because it's, I mean, you go you can walk into any fire station yeah. in the country or in the world and you're going to find the same group of people Very the similar. Table. Exactly. Nor, so one thing I want to highlight, when it comes to surveys and job satisfaction, the highest job satisfaction is actually fire departments over private, over um, third service, uh, any other example you give. And the part about fire EMS is it leads to that camaraderie and that family. So there are certain traditions that should be embraced that are protective for our mental health, eating around the table, just kind of like what you're talking about. Um, and so it is important for anybody in trying to change an agency as big as ours, you know, that there is an embrace or an understanding of that kind of tradition and the ghosts in the wall, they call it. Um, because if, if you come in with these brand new ideas, some type of new age, let's all do yoga, you know, that's that's not going to be well received either. It's going to come from individuals like yourselves who who just highlight the prevalence of this. And to acknowledge it's not a failure because you're burned out doesn't mean you're too weak. It doesn't mean you failed. It's literally a product of your passion, your job, you know, and, and kind of where we're at. And so the fact that you even discuss it means you're strong. It doesn't mean you're weak. And and how to interpret that into man speak is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is more you guys instead of me. But Well, it's yeah, it's like having you could look at it as having an injury, yeah. you know, with sports or whatever. Yeah, you have an injury right now. You have to wait till it heals, and then you can yeah. get back out on the field and play. And burnout is not much different yeah. than that. In you can look at it that way. Of hey, you need to take some yeah. downtime. You need to get, you know, take those steps yeah. that you need to sort yourself back out, and then you know, yeah. come back stronger than ever before. And then since you've been through this, you know the warning signs to look out for him yeah. and her and that guy. And then maybe we catch him early. Yeah. Say, hey, look, I was going down the same road and doing the same thing. You know, again, that's, but you have to have that conversation mm -hmm. yeah. and that respect. And that's part of what we kind of yeah. talked about the other day of, you know, like you brought up the whole eating meals together. Yeah. So that's a huge tradition around the fire station. Well, it's going parts. away. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of stations that are it's okay well the pumper's going to eat right or right. then the okay we'll eat but the ambulance can they can eat when they get back yeah, or, yeah. you know but there are still stations out there that say nope we're waiting yeah because we sit down together yeah and eat and it doesn't yeah. matter if we have to wait till nine yeah. o'clock at night my or, partner on you know, whatever rig is starving right now so i yeah. will starve i will wait and yeah eat when they get that's, home that's one of my two favorite times of the day is when we eat <laughs> and first thing in the morning yeah, yeah. got shift change yeah sitting around drinking coffee because you get that first cup and you kind of catch up on things. Yeah. And then, then it's on. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, but you, you really, you build that camaraderie and stuff and then figure out what you are going to eat for the day. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you guys, how do you interpret when I discuss, say, uh, physical health or spiritual health or um, nutritional health? How do you apply that um, with buy-in? to a station life or a station or, or a crew if, if you're not part of a station. And, and it's well, not something to necessarily be answered on the spot, yeah. but when you start looking at successful agencies who have kind of combated prevalent burnout and suicide, it's literally just that conversation 
being a catalyst for some type of change usually. Yeah. And it's job wide discussion too, not just at yeah. your station, you know, so it's yeah. we were at a station yeah. uh, years ago together. We, we worked the majority of our career at the same state, yeah. the same shift. Yeah. This and is how the podcast was born. Isn't pretty, it? Much, <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. We were friends since the Academy. So yeah. uh, <laughs> went on 17 years, Yeah, but, um, we had a, a period, was it three, four years? Yeah. There towards the end. Yeah. Where everybody, I was, the, I was the one unhealth nut. So, but we ate healthier food and we all worked out together. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it brought us closer as a crew. Plus we were able to talk to each other yeah. easier about bigger things, things you know, that would cause a problem normally, yeah. but it wasn't. That's and I think actually that scientifically proven. You're, you're talking about what the research has shown is that smart. time together. It's true. told you how smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you know, it's, it's also exactly what you were talking about earlier. It's, it, it, it is all inclusive in the sense. So when they talk about leadership and personality clash, it's, that is a, a tougher, um, topic to get into just, just kind of the workplace environment in that regard. So I won't go down that rabbit hole too far. Um, but when you, when you kind of talk about that, um, actually, you know what, you, you could cut that part out. That's probably not a good, good rabbit hole to go down. Is that okay? <laughs> we, can we can just it. change topics. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you know how hard it is for me to cut stuff out? Is it, is it yes. hard? <laughs> it's a pain. Okay, we'll keep it in there. Okay. <laughs> it's not that it's hard. It's a, it's a lot of clicking, and he's lazy. <laughs> he doesn't want to tell you that part. <laughs> no, it's like you have to, you have to cut here to cut here to yeah. take this part out, and then you have to make a match up together. But like well, they don't I'll, match I'll, up. And, with that in mind, I'll kind yeah. of get out with where I was going. So when you look at psychology and trying to be a leader to a personality that you clash with, you think about the captains, BCs, FAOs, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. um, the answer is that you should not be their leader. Then you should pair them up with a personality that you can, um, encourage that success that that you that personality will be okay and so in the fire service fire ems service the reason why i was kind of hesitating is that's not something we can easily change right when when you have your captain or you have your your station mates that is kind of who you are are stuck with for mm -hmm. better or worse um and so it, it is a little bit trickier there when you talk about that personality kind of clash and, and inclusion and, and all that stuff. So there's not really a good answer for that for from the psychology stance for us, because, again, I can't just send somebody. Sometimes you can send them across the city, I guess. <laughs> but do you, you, you get what I'm right. saying. Yeah. You, can't, you can't build hand pick a crew yeah, of, yeah. okay, so this personality and this person, exactly. these yeah. two people will work well together. Yeah. This one was going to cause that a, luxury. Yeah. We don't get yeah. that luxury. It's a seniority bid system. Yep. 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 Sort of. Yep. Yep. You're so. exactly right. And so what we do have though, is that camaraderie and trying to convince our peers to, to stay open-minded and, and, you know, understanding your own triggers and your own boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, what about that patient really got to you and why? What about that coworker or that statement really got to you and why? And when you dig into the psychology of that, obviously usually has nothing to do with that patient or that coworker. It's some type of internal battle. Um, but there are different mechanisms to protect your own energy that you can start to identify, hey, if I'm around so-and-so for too long, I'm just, my burnout's way worse. I'm feeling more strung out. I'm not feeling as good. And so I, I internally, I acknowledge that. I'm going to intentionally, I'm going to say hi. I'm going to get to know him, but I'm going to be aware of my own triggers here. I'm a millennial, so I can use that word. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to be aware, hey, if, I, if I'm, we can use James because he's not here. Hey, oh, if, perfect. I'm, if I'm talking to James and he's getting me riled up, I just, I automatically need to know that about myself and know when I need to leave that situation or conversation mm -hmm. as well. And in the middle of a call, same thing the ability to hit pause and say, why am I in this heightened state? What has gotten to me? And, oh, well, it's because I didn't sleep last night. My kid's sick. I'm 
getting thrown onto the ambulance for 24 hours or, or whatever it is. It's rarely about that one patient. Yeah. I try to take anything out on patients we run or coworkers, but yeah. you are human. Yeah. Yeah. The, so you, no matter how much you fight it, yeah. sometimes you're going to lose I mean, that battle for yeah. a moment. And people have yeah. heard me say, you know, working outside of medicine, for instance, in a bar, I work in a bar, you hit on me and it's not, um, not the right situation. I'm not asking for it, but you keep grabbing my butt or whatever it may be. I can kick you out. Mm -hmm. That's the bar. Medicine, it's the opposite. Well, come with me still. I got to put you in the back of my ambulance and take you to, to my emergency room, you know, where I still have to. And so people hear me say tough love can be good medicine, but that's coming from a healthy place. Yeah. So unfortunately, what we see with a bunch of our burnout providers is that tough love coming from a very unhealthy place. And and I mean, honestly, if, if you've got somebody who is burnt out, again, you're already behind the eight ball in regards to trying to to help in that situation, you still can help, but it is definitely more intense by the time burnout's been reached. So I think that's kind of where we're at right now is we've got a lot of, of burnout. There's a pandemic going on. Um, there's a job loss, pay cuts, budget crisis, and then you try to take care of a patient in the midst of that. And so I, I can't fix all those things for our crews. You know, I, I wish I could. We all wish we could. But how can we get our crews to not commit suicide and to not um, ruin their one shot of life, you know, just, just because of this job? It's an interesting position that we find ourselves in as of today. And like I mentioned earlier, we discussed it for three hours this morning, you know, at one of the meetings. So I do see, and being part of this podcast even, I see little glimmers of hope. There's people who have identified, hey, this is an issue. We've got to talk about this. We can't ignore this anymore. We're beyond the point. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. now it, this is not addressed. It's not sustainable. Yeah, That's, no. And it's, it's, yeah. it's a worldwide yeah. issue. Yeah. It's, it, and it's not, I mean, it's not so much even at work, but what's your stressors at home? Yeah. Too. Yeah. You know, no, like there, there was a period where, yeah, I was burnt out, but my wife and I weren't getting along exactly. at all. Exactly. Yeah. Like it was, let's sign the paper. Yes. Let's go. We're so done. the symptoms of burnout that might not be discussed, divorce, that's a big part, agitation, sleep issues, insomnia, mm -hmm. stomach issues is a huge one. All of these things that you could be going to the doctor for could literally just be the symptom of your burnout, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. It takes yeah. a lot of work to fix it too. I mean, yeah, we had to work on it. It, was, it wasn't just fixing me. It was fixing her. My, she's fixing herself. I'm fixing myself. Yeah. And then we're still coming together to fix us. Yeah. Yeah. No and problem. the... There's never an end, you know, when no. it comes to mental health and our own no. health. It's never like when you're working out, I reach this goal and that's it, I'm done. There's always the maintenance work afterwards. Right. Well, and I think yeah. that is the, as far as with people in our career field, that is one of the biggest issues yeah. of, okay, yeah, I had this problem. So now I'm going to, okay, I'm going to go get help. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. I've got six sessions. Fix me. Yep. I'm not fixing six. I, what the hell, you know, yeah. because whenever we go on a call, we go, we do it, whatever it is, it's fixed yeah. or we take them to the hospital and it's fixed there or, you know, whatever happens happens, but it's right then. Yeah. It's not this long drawn out. Okay. we got to fight every day. We got to do yeah. this every day and mm -hmm. this every day. That's not how mental health works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like the, again, I'm going to reference Deadpool. Yeah. <laughs> It's like how he's talking about being a hero. You wake up every morning and brush your teeth, the hero. You <laughs> take a shower, you're a hero. That's what you're in, that. <laughs> if you were in that movie, you'd be Brad Pitt's part. You know that, right? Probably. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See? Seen the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, once. He saw once. it. <laughs> Maybe twice. I, I catch it on TV every once in a while. Yeah. I actually own it. Yeah. Did you know that? I own that movie. I own both. Do you of guys them. mind if I ask you some questions? Sure. I don't, well, just <laughs> no. in, in talking about that transition in your guys' history and being the, in the academy together and then 17 years and then coming to this podcast, what really um, was the beginning steps of, of focusing on mental health in this podcast for you guys? 
Uh, I'll let Jeremy take that one. Well, yeah, that was me. Um, so I had my own issues. Yeah. Um, my dad passed away a couple years ago, and then I went down a really, really dark path. Yeah. Um, I had always kind of been drinking a little bit too much. Yeah. And a little bit too much became a lot yeah. too much. Yeah. Um, did some dumb stuff. Ended up cheating on my wife. Um, got caught. And my response to that was to put not one but two guns to my head. Mm, sorry to hear that. Okay. And she took them away from me. Yeah. And ended up going into Valor. Uh, first I went yeah. into, you know, a 96 hour psych hold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was super awesome. I know. They're the they, exact opposite I way to heal. Re <laughs> recommend those highly. <laughs> it was great. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But then I went into Valor. Yeah. Um, went through that process, came out and, you know, it, seeing the people that I was in Valor with, yeah. you know, made a couple of friends in there or whatever. Um, but then just kind of my eyes being open to yeah. all of those issues. Cause my yeah. wife is a therapist. Really? Like, and this is the population that she deals with yeah, military yeah. first responders, yeah. you know, and all that. So I have no excuse. Yeah. I, as soon as I started kind of, you know, yeah. I could have talked to her at any point, but nope, I got this. I'm a mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. I'll just drink it away, yeah. you know, uh, then other shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But after all that got out, I did, uh, some neurofeedback. Yeah. Um, went through a treatment with that and that was very eye opening yeah. and helped to really get my brain kind of firing uh -huh, again uh -huh. and on all cylinders and i don't know i think it was be even before that that we had kind of started talking about doing a podcast yeah, i had never really like i'd heard about podcasts and i was like oh that's some hipster crap <laughs> you know or whatever they're talking about i don't even know what but so i'm like scrolling through youtube of like watching off-road videos yeah. and stuff like that because i'm into jeeps and all that stuff and I stumble across uh, a Joe Rogan yeah. podcast. And yeah. I'm like, oh, well, Joe's funny as hell. This will be <laughs> this will be great, right? Yeah. It'll be super funny. Well, he has on this former Navy SEAL yeah. named Andy Stomp, and so I sat there and I watched that podcast, and I'm like, all right. Well, then the next one is this with another former Navy SEAL named uh -huh. Jocko, uh -huh. and watch that one. And I'm like, all right, this is cool. So then I start researching. Yeah. They're talking about mental health uh -huh. and all this other stuff, and. Just kind of like very interesting. I'm like, hey, I could do something like yeah. that. You know, we yeah. could, I know some people that you know, and a I lot know of some people. Messed up people. <laughs> yeah, I know some messed up people that will come talk on camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I was just, I got to the point where it was like, you know what? If I can put stuff like this out mm -hmm. yep. and get it out there in the world, who knows who will watch it? Yeah, and maybe recognize, okay. I'm going down that road or, mm -hmm. okay, here's a resource I didn't know about that could help me or I didn't expect that yep. or whatever. That's and fantastic. if we could help just one person, yeah, one person. It's literally saving a life. Yeah. Yeah. You so know, why not? you touched on a couple of topics that I want to kind of dig into a little bit. Valor being one of them. And the thing about Valor and the success of Valor versus like a 96 hour hold is that, um, it is, it is structured exactly what you said for public service. Mm -hmm. It is definitely specialized to folks who understand that field life, so to speak. Yeah. And the other thing that I do want to comment on as well is the openness with sharing that story. So the D, um, you know, I, so myself personally, I struggle with depression and anxiety. Almost 100% of human beings on planet earth, especially during this pandemic, struggle with depression to some extent. And then you throw the public safety and everything else on top of it. That kind of makes it. And so the, the kind of joke with the mental health is health sweatshirt that's literally what that is about in regards to your guys' podcast as well. It's just that discussion and that awareness and getting that out there. 
That doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you failed. You might have messed up, sure, but it doesn't mean that you are a failure or weak. It means you are a human being who is living their life on earth right now. A human being who is living their life on earth in a fire EMS service is very prone to depression and burnout and suicidality. So the fact that we as a specialty have have made it tough to discuss. You know, I one other thing to kind of touch on just to transition is we were talking earlier, there's the two personalities that we kind of work with, those who take resources more seriously versus those who kind of abuse the resources that are, <laughs> that are kind of out there and given to you. Yep. And the thing I have found is the loud, complaining folks, that's usually a minority of folks. The majority of folks really just want to have that type of conversation and have a good life. You've got one shot at life, and I just want to do my damn best in, in succeeding, whatever that may look like. And so when you start to kind of take away those um, – stamps that historically we've put on people for being depressed or suicidal you realize that the audience of people that you're talking to is very wide there's a huge group of people who who benefit from the conversation they just might not put themselves out there as much as you guys know yeah. and so to have people coming forward sharing their own stories is a huge um, transition just in regards to our personality type, our specialty type. To hear people share their stories is not something that that you frequently encounter and, until more recently. So thank you guys for that and thank you for sharing that part of the story because that makes a difference. It's literally the people you're around the table with. Those are the people who have the same issues. It might just look different. Yeah. But it is the same. You are a human being on planet Earth with one life to live and all of the stress associated with it. And so if we don't, we've, we've just alienated mental illness for so long. To It's kind of like cancer patients. Cancer patients always say, I'm not my cancer. I am myself. You know, treat me like myself. It's the same with burnout and depression. Mm -hmm. I am not my depression. I am Erica Carney. But you still have to be able to discuss that and not be labeled yeah. as that. Well, and that's the, historically, that's been the culture yes. with the fire service is yeah. you're too weak. Yep. You can't handle yep. it. You need to find another job. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, if I can guess, has a lot to do with people kind of abusing services over the years. I could be wrong. Um, I would agree with yeah. that. I think it has a lot to do with personality types because when you talk about police and fire, it's a lot of former military. Yeah especially in the, the like the generation that's still the older generation that we still have working. Yeah. A lot of them are for military or they're raised by people who, you know, some, some would be world war two a little bit, but v Vietnam and Korea mm -hmm. and it's just a different generation yeah. and different parenting. That's a really good point. You know? How our parents parented and how their parents parented mm -hmm. and then how we as parents parent, yeah. you know, I, I know my dad exactly was easier right. on, on me and my uh -huh. brother than, than his, his dad, dad was. was on him. Exactly. He, he was still hard on us. So yeah. you're wrong. And yeah. I was easier on my son, but still hard on him yeah. whenever he was growing up. And I think the important thing about individuals like yourselves sharing kind of experiences and what you went through and, and kind of publicly speaking on it is you're not um, you're not um, trying to change the entire tradition or culture, although there are some changes we could all make everywhere, you know. Um, but you're part of it. You're part of that tradition, and you are still able to kind of talk about this and and still be accepted and not seen as as somebody who's weak. I think that's the place that we really need to get to. Yeah, and I think any change starts with at the personal level. Yes. And then it'll, you know, spider web its yeah, way out. Yeah, yeah I've and, said it, you know, since even before we started this podcast is it, it almost needs to be a grassroots yeah. movement yes. through the ranks. You know, it, I, me personally, I don't feel like this is something that you can legislate from the top down. Yeah, yeah. You can't say, okay, we're changing the culture. Yeah immediately because you know the personalities there's going to be hard pushback we're yeah. not doing that yeah that's yeah. not the way it's been yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't care if it's good for me <laughs> well, 
Why do you sound yeah. like me? <laughs> <laughs> When did James get here? Yeah. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> yes. I hope he hears that. Oh, he's going to hear oh, that. He's gonna hear I'm going to text James, him. James, I love you. I'm just joking. I am going to edit this and publish this and send him the link immediately whenever we get done. Yeah. But you're exactly right. And that's actually what our lesson was with critical incident stress debriefing mm -hmm. is that it couldn't be an outsider who forced this on somebody. It mm. had to be grassroots, kind of an organic yeah acknowledgement mm -hmm. yeah and also there has to be permission um either from the agency or whoever to have time and space to appropriately have those conversations you know yeah. Yeah. it can't just like you said be scheduled in to where monday morning let's talk about or you know maybe some people function better with that scheduled and i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just know it's it's got to be organic that's yeah. the best grassroots is the best way to describe it you're exactly right yeah. so after, after he got a valley we took some classes dealing with mental health and yeah. kind of had to recognize things and not really treatment but maybe, yeah i don't know you... it was a suicide prevention stuff yeah. Yeah. that we did with i can't remember which i can't remember yeah. it was but yeah and I'm, so. I'm not implying to um, diagnose or, or to be on the physician side where I just kind of yeah. keep asking questions. Um, but I would almost, so don't let me put words in your mouth, but mm -hmm. I would almost call it kind of a redefinition of focus. What is mm -hmm. important in life? Yeah. I, I took my dad, he worked at one of the mental health hospitals for years in town, more on the social work side. And one of the well-known psychiatrists that he worked with was presenting at a conference. So I took my dad with me. We went to this. This was just probably five or ten years ago, which is kind of fun. And um, the guy was focusing on mental health. And he says, what is your hobby? What do you do outside of your career? And for the majority of us, we are our career, right? Mm -hmm. I am a firefighter. I am an EMS physician. I am an ER physician. That is literally what all of my efforts and my school debt, everything has been targeted towards this career. So when we see a career like EMS um, and the issues of EMS and the pandemic and poor pay and, and burnout, you're identifying with that, you know, that that is you, that I am my career. And so I had to sit back and think, well, before medicine, I had hobbies, you know, I. I actually did physical fitness. I um, played the guitar. Since medicine, I had lost a crap ton of weight. I was severely malnourished. I have probably a little bit of kidney damage from never going pee when I should, you know. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I smoke. I, I've quit. I quit every day. But there's definitely unhealthy habits that, that you know, that, that come into that. And so to redefine, well, geez, Louise, I don't have a hobby. What, you know? And so what, what kind of life changes does an event like that lead to? Yeah. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And, and just redefine, what do I want my life on this earth to look like? And acknowledging that life is actually outside of your job. It includes your job, but it, your life is not your job, period. Your life is your relationships, your coworkers, your your body. You've got one body, and you've got to treat her, him, they. You've got to treat your body well, because that's the one body that you've got. You know, mm -hmm. somebody explained the human body to me once, like a a nice cigar box, the really nice old school cigar boxes. You know, what I'm talking about really hand paint, hand painted, mm -hmm. just like really nice gifts. Imagine you have your grandkid over, they come running by and they drop it on the floor and it shatters and you try to glue it back together. It will never be the same cigar box that it started with. The human body's the same. Mm -hmm. You've got one body that you're born with and you can injure it easily in our line of work. We see a lot of on the job injuries and a lot of off the job injuries as well. Um, and we can try on the physician side, we can try to tape you back together, piece you back together, but it will never be that pristine bone structure that we started with. That, that healing will just never replace that preventative component of getting good sleep, redefining what is your purpose in life. That's the spiritual connection that the studies kind of get at. Why are you here? 
Is it to get up and to do those 24 hour shifts? Is it, is it something else? Um, and then, so the physical health, the spiritual health, the nutritional health, all of these things that we do poorly on a day-to-day -day basis in, in fire EMS that truly allow protective, preventative boundaries. If I am well-nourished, well-rested, I can protect myself against any exacerbating injury or insult, you know? But we are chronically sleep deprived, chronically hungover, chronically, <laughs> you know, we are on the cycle of uppers and downers. We got our mm -hmm. coffee in the morning and our alcohol in the evening. Or if you're working nights, you know, mm -hmm. alcohol in the morning and coffee at nighttime. And um, yeah, so I, I don't think changing that culture is me necessarily as an outsider, although I have been well accepted into this family. So I've got to quit saying I'm an outsider. I, I do think it is, it's you guys, it is the crews, it is the personnel identifying how important protecting your body and your emotions and your, your mind is. Part of that protection is avoiding gossip, avoiding negative energy, you know, like <laughs> yep. Yep, it's preventative and protective. I know that we got back into hobbies a lot. Like yeah. Jeremy bought the Jeep and we've, yeah. we've gone Jeeping together. Yes, exactly. We, we both have motorcycles. We do that. Uh -huh, you know, my uh -huh. wife goes out with, Rachel rides with you, doesn't she? Uh, she hasn't in a while. I like how she, he doesn't know what his wife is. <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> well, normally when we go ride, it's just a, it's yeah, yeah. us. And Maria yeah. just bought one. So yeah. he, he rides yeah. with us yeah. and it's, it's a good way to get away. Something you enjoy and, you outside know, of your job. Growing up in the smaller, smaller town, you know, learned how to shoot when I was a kid. Yeah. That's always been, I love shooting. Yeah. Yeah. So I do that a lot. Yeah. When I can, although I can't afford it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah. It, an interesting thing about hobbies too. So think about a way to let loose. That's a little different than a hobby. That's the alcohol, right? That's every mm -hmm. definition of, of an American let loose. It always involves alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to a hobby, it is different than just kind of that relaxation or that mm -hmm. benefit. It is something that you are putting energy into because you enjoy it, yeah. you know? And I definitely don't drink near as much. I hardly drink at all anymore. Yeah. I mean, socially, but that's even that's every once every few months yeah, yeah. anymore. I just, I don't care. Yeah, and you go through phases. You know, there mm -hmm. there might be a phase where you definitely drink well, more. Well, summertime's coming. Yep, and it's a <laughs> pandemic, and you can't go out. You know, so um, I I think that you have to embrace things in moderation. But the oh, true definition of the hobby is something that defines you outside yeah. of well, like this even, job. Even my wife and I started getting into woodworking. Yeah. So exactly. It's been, it's been a learning example. experience and I've messed up a lot of wood. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> like why we, that door frame was a yeah, little. <laughs> that's, that's not mine. Mine, <laughs> mine are straight. Yeah. Still in denial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, in these face. walls are about as 45 as you can get them. <laughs> <laughs> as you can get them. Yeah. Just... Well, I, I had to go off the concrete. What they, what they <laughs> yeah, that's gotcha. not my fault. Uh, yeah. It does look fantastic. Thank you. So what hobbies do you do now? Uh, that are... Well, that's actually a really good yeah. question. Yeah. I had an old Jeep that I worked on yeah. quite a lot and I'm just to the point where I'm done with it and I'm going to sell it. Yeah. So, cause it's broken for the last time. <laughs> <laughs> no longer a hobby uh, at that no, point. <laughs> no longer a hobby. Um, but it was something that yeah. I enjoyed doing. So, yeah. um, play my guitar yes. occasionally, Music's video games. Um, yep. I think my biggest hobby was with my dogs. Yeah. Um, hanging out with my wife. Yeah. Um, but we just had to put, Oh, uh, one of my dogs down. I'm on so Sunday. sorry. So, yeah, it was very unexpected. Yeah. Um, so, I'm you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I showed up to a scene once. It was Christmas Eve, two or three Christmases ago. And I show up on scene, and it's one of those where it's, it's cooking. You've got smoke inhalation galore. You know, you've got multiple patients. And our, our crew handled it very well, but I get there, and there's a puppy everybody's rushing towards the puppy. Is this puppy okay? Mm -hmm. And here I am like, how about the humans? <laughs> <laughs> They're fine. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they were. Fine. Yeah. yeah. They give but us a thumbs up. the amount up. of love I mean, that we have towards our pets dog, is deep. Yeah. Pets just, dog, dogs in general, but pets, I mean, they, Yeah. it's just different. Yeah. That actually mm -hmm. is another scientifically proven 
um, life prolonger is having a pet that you jive with. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different thing living under your care, you know? Yeah. So, but then translating that. So let's, let's make this an action item. I bring my ukulele into a fire station and I say, Hey, this is going to fix all your problems. Right. You know that it doesn't necessarily <laughs> challenge accepted. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. We can try that. There's only one song that's acceptable to play on the ukulele. What is that? Somewhere over the I knew you were going to say that. That's everybody. That's my all time favorite yeah, song it's too. It's actually one of the easiest ones. I'll is have it? to teach it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. tiny bubbles. Yeah. I don't know that one on the ukulele. <laughs> Maybe there Somebody's you go. going to download later. some cheap music later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but my, my point in that comment is it's truly a culmination of, of overall health and the buy-in to that overall health. It can't just be one or the other. You pick and choose. Hey, I am in this horrible depression, so now I'm going to play ukulele. Yes, that helps, but it also requires, you talked about some counseling associated with that. Mm -hmm. And for extreme cases of burnout, there's the cognitive behavioral therapy where you literally have to retrain your brain mm -hmm. on how to respond to certain environments. Yep. And so it is, and it's a long, long process. Yeah. It's not the instant gratification that, hey, I come in and play the ukulele and, and the world is good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? exactly. well, so Jeremy brought up the neurofeedback. Yeah. And I, I yeah. actually just got done doing it. Yeah. And it was, it was eye-opening. That first time when she met my brain out and my fight or flight response yeah. was skyrocketed. Yeah. And I was calm as could be. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that's know, how your brain has the, been the wired. Sleep, my sleeping has been so much better. I still have those nights. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like last night I couldn't sleep at all, but I was working too. Yeah. And, but my sleep at home, it's been great. Yeah. 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 And it just like, and I'm sure she told you the, the longer that it goes, the better. Yeah. So like, you're going to kind of like what they told me whenever I had my last knee surgery was in about 18 months, that's whenever you're going to see like the most improvement yeah. and it's the same. Yeah. You're exactly so, right. I mean, my shoulder stuck. I had shoulder surgery what over a year ago. Yeah. yeah. And it's still not right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can yeah. tell the, the difference in strength Yeah. from before. Yeah. yeah. And same thing even, but even the, I can not, now I can catch myself when I start to not feel burnout, but the compassion, we talk about compassion yeah. fatigue. I, I yeah. can feel it coming. Yeah. I'm like, all right. I know it's coming. Yep. So now I got to reset myself yep. and fight it. That's a really important point. It's learning yourself and learning that you are messed up, yeah. you know, from, yeah. from this history and learning how to, to acknowledge that because you're not going to change that overnight, but at least if you have insight into it and yeah. acknowledge it, you can start to make a little bit of a difference and say, Hey, this one patient, it's really mm -hmm. getting to me. What's going on? Yeah. What's going on? Oh, it's because I fought with my husband or whatever, whatever it may be that's underlying all of that. Yeah. Well, and it's like you said, it's like it's catching it earlier. Yeah. We've kind of talked yeah. about that kind of in a circle or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, you start catching these issues earlier because post-traumatic stress is a completely normal. That's part of your mm -hmm. body. It, mm -hmm. it, it happens. Yep. The the downside or the bad part is whenever it, you let it go too long yeah. it becomes disorder so if you get it before it gets to that disorder yeah. stage then yeah. you have ptg which is post-traumatic growth yeah why don't why doesn't anybody talk about that yeah yeah you're you know? exactly right because that's a real thing yeah and it needs to be put out there because a lot of people is oh it's so bad i yeah. got this ptsd and well do you really have ptsd yeah. Or do you just have PTS yeah. and, you know, if you go do some treatments or go yeah. do whatever, then you can get on the growth side of it. Yes. Yes. And you said an important point. You said, number one, it's natural. Anybody mm -hmm. in our line of work is going to be exposed to that. That's what the studies show us. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we know that's the thing. And then it is, um, it is a lot of times requiring some type of appointment with a specialist that we also want to encourage and invite amongst mm -hmm. our peers. You know, it's to go to a specialist. I've been to a psychiatrist. You guys have been to psychiatrists. We've all been to counselors. It's something that, that 
needs to be better accepted because we know the outcome, the PTSD, that whole side of it is mm -hmm. pretty sure, you know, we, we pretty much know that's a lot of our personnel. And so we also have to normalize the treatment side of it, just, just like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And there are more people now, I, I don't know this for certain, but my feeling is there's more people now identifying that and feeling comfortable talking about that because of this pandemic and kind of post pandemic and redefining what is important in life for me. And if I am home every day with this mortal injury, this PTSD, this burnout, that's no way to live. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the redefinition of what do I want the majority of my days to look like positive or negative? <laughs> and then yep. taking those steps to, to allow that to be. And then on the authoritative side, on the white shirt side, it's us also allowing those environments and providing support and a lot of times budget to allow those things to also occur. So again, multifactorial. <laughs> <laughs> Setting your people up for success. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yes. It's got to be the buy-in top down, bottom yep. up, just like what we keep saying. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. hundred percent. Just takes time. That's the, that's the thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's just, you know, you, I know you brought it up earlier and yeah. you talked about it. There's no quick fix. No, there's not. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. it's going to take a lot of work, you know, and we've talked about previously, you know, we are so far what we know yeah. now, we should have known 20 years yeah, ago, yeah. you know, and we're playing catch up yep. and playing catch up because all of those problems that have been manifesting and you know, yeah. all that they're hitting now. Yep. And we're still trying to play catch up, yes. put programs in place mm -hmm. to do this, to mm -hmm. that. We're behind the eight ball. We like are. You said. We are. So, but what is more important than living a good life, you know, with, yeah. with your one shot at life. And, and so that I think helps emphasize the importance, um, and the urgency of the situation. I mean, when, when you're talking about it and, and suicidality and the suicide rate amongst our peers and ourselves, it, it is truly life-saving conversations that, that are starting to occur. So even though it does take time and it takes a lot of effort, it obviously is one of the most important things that we can be doing mm -hmm. and supporting as an agency and, and as friends and, and peers. And I, I think there's more people who are seeing that. I really do. Um, now, in regards to resources in general, mental health doesn't have the most resources in general. We, we saw there was three trends that we noticed in Corona that were parallel to the Corona pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first trend that we saw as EMS agencies around the world, we meet weekly. At that time, it was more frequent, but now it's weekly. And we started comparing our numbers and our call natures and, and kind of where we were at. And the first trend that we noticed is the out-of-hospital cardiac arrests went way up in certain areas. Kansas City helped contribute to this publication. Our out-of-hospital cardiac arrests were also increased, just like every other agency. Um, the other trend that we saw, so that was the first trend we saw in parallel with corona, the second trend that we saw in parallel with Corona was the increased penetrating trauma. So lots of shootings and stabbings. That was the second phase of this pandemic. The third phase of the pandemic, unfortunately, has been the mental illness associated with working in and living through a pandemic. And so we saw some agencies with their EAP services saturated. There was just not enough counseling sessions, whatever, to go around. And then we saw other agencies with kind of an opposite effect where people were um, less likely to, to share that at work. I can't say where we were on that regard because I don't know. I don't know the answer with where we were um, on that, that side. But what we found is that healthcare workers are not immune to these trends, meaning we saw increased suicide and healthcare workers, pre-hospital and in the hospital. And that is the part of the pandemic that we are currently living in right now for the patients and our personnel. And so when we talk about urgency and change and redefining life, 
what is a better reason to redefine tradition or a history than a pandemic that has forced that, that conversation or that redefinition? So my hope in moving forward as we're kind of, you know, we still have a little bit of an increase in corona in, in our region right now, but we are definitely on the downward um, side of that entire trend and all of those peaks that we saw. I want to take that momentum and run with it. This was it changed our lifestyle. We had stay at home orders. We can't go outside without masks on now. 300 million people have died from this thing and even more hospitalized, you know, and this is a virus that was brand new. Let's use that to redefine what our life in general looks like as EMS personnel, as EMS agencies and, and fire services. Let's not lose that momentum. My fear is that once this pandemic ends, that we go back to all of the superficial BS that, that we were in beforehand. I wanna use this opportunity that, that we were given this opportunity for better or worse, you know, this pandemic happened, no matter what we had to say about it, let's use that huge event to take resources and redirect them into mental health and into these kind of conversations. And that's, that's my call to any white shirts who are, on any of these podcasts or, or city managers or mayors. And that's the message I take going forward. We shouldn't go right back to the way things were. We should use this momentum to make important changes and acknowledge true issues that have occurred within Abs our specialty. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, if you, grow. Yeah. Everybody. if you don't learn from the mistakes that we've made in yeah. the past and the history, and being able to look back and say, oh, if we would have did this or yes. what, well, guess what? We can do that in the future. Now. Yes. We yes. have the opportunity yes. to continue and do some good stuff, yep. or we also have the opportunity to go back to being shit bags. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, I, unlike any event in our lifetime, similar to 9-11, I would say, very similar, we, we see this, this, um, this opportunity that's that's the word I'll, I'll use for it to just redirect funding on the legislative side redirect funding on the medicine side and to mental health and then the other thing about mental health is mental health is not just mental illness so that goes with the diagnoses and everything we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, mental health is all inclusive so when we talk about resources going into mental health we're talking about protective preventative measures right. not just the response to a mental illness yeah. type of episode yeah how about we start being as a country and this yeah. goes beyond fire service yeah, yeah. or whatever how about we start being proactive yes. about these type of things exactly because we know there's a problem and we can yes. it's it doesn't take a genius to see that there is going to be a problem in the future yeah. just from you know the budgets that have yeah. been cut and the things that have happened and all that okay look at what problems it's yeah. led to so far how about we have a little bit of foresight yep. and go, okay, before this gets out of hand, we're going to put this in place to fix yes, that. Yes. It's like, you don't, you're not sitting in your house looking at your ceiling and there's a pipe and it's doing a little drip yeah, and yeah. you're going, yeah, see, that's a little drip, but <laughs> I'm not going to do anything about it. Let's just wait until it completely break, breaks, yeah. floods the house. We'll get the canoe. And the cost to fix that is yeah way yeah. higher right yeah. than than being preventative yeah. about that and so i i want to invite any of the listeners to truly use this time right now as we talk to take that minute to redefine why are you alive why are you doing what you're doing today and if you don't know those answers, which I didn't when I took my dad to the, see the psychiatrist, I was like, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, to save people, maybe, you know. But then when you look at your lifestyle outside of saving people, I'm not spending time with my husband, my son. When I'm home, I'm not flipping the switch off. My mind's still always on, just like what you're saying with mm -hmm. perpetually living at the fight or flight stage. And so the redefinition of what I am doing dedicating my entire energy and life to it's not an easy thing to do as we've all said it's yeah. very you have to be very conscious of that you have to be very protective of your energy i know that sounds very spacey and new age but it it's 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 i'll, I'll pause there it's it's something that's very important in this time of of history where we're at right now
Yeah. redefining why we're here yep. and and what our purpose in life is and it can be firefighting it can be but it should also be some other stuff as well yeah yeah um is it your sunrise when you get up and see the sunrises in the morning is it your time with your child or your spouse or your pet or is it um on your hobbies like we were talking about why are you alive what are you doing with your limited amount of time on this planet and that is what you will remember when you're on your deathbed, not a bunch of this other stuff that we dedicate our mind space to, that limited cardboard box mind space that yep. you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that question. <laughs> yeah, and you know, maybe maybe you do one day and then it also changes the next day, but it's just re giving yourself permission to dedicate your energy and your um, fuel, your what's keeping you going during the day to different focuses. You know, when I realized that my purpose of being ali alive is not to be an EMS physician, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. It's kind of like, what, what am I outside of this as a human being? Am I a good spouse? Am I a good sister? Am I a good daughter? Am I a good friend? No, I, I hadn't been <laughs> up until that point. And I'm still not the best. You know, we've got limited time. But now I am this year, especially 2021, working on boundaries. Hey, if you're calling me, we've got hundreds of providers, right? Mm -hmm. And with my many hats, it's it's more than just one agency. If you are calling me at 7 p.m. and I'm not working a shift, is it an emergency? That's my new question now. I love talking to you and I want to hear you, but what is more important to me is that I have a healthy marriage and a healthy son and a healthy mm -hmm. personal life, which I'm still not the healthiest. I'm not trying to act like mm -hmm. I am, but learning that boundary. Somebody in my mid-30s, I've never done that before. And for the first time ever, I feel like a jerk sometimes because I'm like, hey, is this an emergency? Yes or no? 99% of the time, it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will schedule you in then. I'm going to put you on my calendar for Friday. At this time, I'll be in the office. Can I call you then? Perfect. Yeah. I'm protecting my home life, though, and, and yeah. doing yeah. that. You definitely got to have a balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy to learn. No. It's no, not easy it to do not. either. Yeah. Even though you learn it, it's hard to enforce, too, because yeah. you still want to be that person. Yeah. yeah. So in leading help. in this grassroots movement, a psychology kind of conversation is the leaders have to also be able to have boundaries as well and respect those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So if you have a boss or somebody who is taking full advantage of you and calling in certain off hours as a leader, they're not, they're not setting a good example of that boundary. Right. So leaders yep. have to do it too, as yep. on top of the personnel. It's whenever you just either don't answer the phone yep. or you answer it and give them a few choice words yep and yep you can you, deal with it tomorrow you have your predefined conclusion to the conversation yeah. in the sense so for me if it's not an emergency that door is still shut yeah does that make depending mm -hmm. on what the issue is yeah. yeah you guys all know obviously i will help out depending on what the issue is so i don't yeah. want to imply that but that permission of that boundary i've already got it in my mind if this is not that issue keeping that door closed, that flip switched off, and I'm still dedicating time to my husband and son. Because yeah. yeah. otherwise, what I do is I turn that switch on, and then I am just gone the rest of the night. I might be watching TV with you, but I'm not actually there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not actually resting. I'm not rested. You usually got your phone in your hand. You're exactly. texting somebody yeah. back yeah. or dealing with an issue at work. Or Sounds eerily familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and an important, and I don't know what the time frame is, so just cut me off when we're ready. But the important thing yeah. about social media, that instant access, 24-7, that messenger, whatever it may be, and talking about kind of protecting your energy, mm -hmm. that's something that's for the generation, our generation, but also kind of the newer generation below us, that's not a skill that is taught or ingrained into you. No to protect yourself hmm. from that type of and social media yeah. actually builds in programs it does. to counteract that. Exactly. It, they want you, they want yeah. that next click. They want that yes. next thing. And the more that you're scrolling through, the better for them yep. it is. Yep. Yeah. You watch that documentary. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good documentary. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I, was, I was like, I said that I said that yeah. I said that I'm like, man, this, 
Make me and feel then you good. get back on your Facebook <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Maybe. Like, I just watched yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's things that we embrace with social media. If I want to get a message out to you guys, mm -hmm. the quickest way for me to do that, usually is social See, media, I'll, right? That, when you do that, I'm actually a big fan. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, yeah. Even, yeah. even the, I get the negative comments. Yeah. You're not yeah. never get away from that anywhere. Yeah. yeah. But, but see, that's the difference of social media, of how it should intentional be. Intentional social media use yeah. versus mm -hmm. being pulled into yeah. the. Yeah. Of how which it is, is tough actually battle. used. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and trying to set that boundary. Yeah. Hey, if I'm on it, and realizing that with the AI component and the addictive nature of such things, especially with our personalities leaning more towards addictive behaviors, if you are going to get on Facebook, set a freaking time limit. Do something that triggers your mind to put it down and step away from it. So one of the best things to prevent your to help with your mental health um, is to put your phone in the opposite room and mm -hmm. to not go into that room. Mm -hmm. Just small actions like that, mm -hmm. that when we first got Facebook, I, I was gra graduating college or in college, can't remember which year exactly, but that yeah. didn't come with a warning sign no. <laughs> on it mm -hmm. that you're going to spend the rest of your life on these things, you know? I don't think anybody expected it to blow up the way it did. Yeah. I'm still a MySpace fan. Oh. I miss MySpace. Zango, is that yeah. anybody? Oh. Anybody? <laughs> I miss. I miss Tom. Yeah. <laughs> MySpace yeah. was easier to manage. Was. Yeah. And you could build it to, yeah. to yourself. Yeah. I had music and yeah. I. Yeah. Oh yeah. So what I'll say about all of it is, it's truly got to be in moderation. And if you're not in a healthy place to moderate yourself, then it's it's tougher. Yeah. It's definitely tougher. So well, it's not just Facebook. I mean, you got Instagram, yeah. Snapchat, all this stuff. TikTok, all of it. Yeah. Twitter. I don't, I don't have that. Or TikTok, I don't either. Or yeah. Instagram or yeah. Snapchat. I got Facebook and that's it. I've got, I that. I've got Facebook, but therein, obviously, depending on the time you dig into Facebook, it's, it's this energy suck. Mm -hmm. It is just. Oh, yeah. You so, never know what you're going to see on it. Yeah. Even the news, like when the that's news a good posts, point. I'm like, yeah. man, it seems like every, you get like one good thing. Like, oh, that's great. And then 25 crappy stories. Yeah. It yeah. just brings you down. Well, you remember the, remember the saying, if it bleeds, it leads. Yep. Yep. I mean, and that's the thing. That's why I don't watch the news at night yeah, yeah. or in the morning. I That's yeah. one of my biggest things about, and every fire station, news is on. In the morning, at mm -hmm. lunch, at yeah, night, yeah. you know, everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's that's it's been that way for years. Yeah. For me personally, I couldn't care less. Yeah. Because it's nothing but, they don't show the good stuff. Right, right. They have a narrative that they want to push, and it is always bad. Yeah. It's I mean, except for the grabbing. cute puppy yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, that they do on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Oh, hey, we're adopting a bunch of cute puppies, yeah, yeah. and they're awesome, and... <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, a bomb blew up over here killing 100 million people. Yeah. It's like, no. Okay, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm done. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And it's not – so everything in moderation. I'll just kind of keep yeah. coming yeah. back to that. There's, And if, if you are in a place where you are not able to moderate, then that is also obviously a big sign of, of burnout and, and not being in a good place in general. Um, and so there, there are things that can be used for good, like the news, like Facebook, they can be used for good. But what, what we have acknowledged with the technology boom is that it is the majority of the time, probably not good, no. <laughs> probably not. And <laughs> I, that's I probably going to get worse over the yeah. years. Did you, you ever know? watch her on the news? Did you ever watch her? <laughs> they were great. I thought you did a good job. No. The mic was like this. Yeah. I'm always very short, but they're, they're fixing that every time because they actually know me. I just had to throw that in there. I'm sorry. I had to. <laughs> Except for our mic, which has moved. Yeah. I know. Continued to move down throughout the show. I know. Am, am I still doing good with yeah. it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just, but, but as far as you, when you were on the news talking about everything, I thought you did a great job. Oh, thank you. So it was informative. Just like when you put your the stuff out on, on, the fa yeah, on Facebook, yeah. it was informative to yeah. the point. And yeah, I think. A, with, a, a lot of the myths that were out early with the virus and yeah. like, hey, this is what we're seeing. And you were able to show it and break it down and make it to where a dumb fireman could understand it. Well, and I think a big component of that is just some type of transparency and communication. Yeah. So it's, it's not even necessarily that I'm good at that because I've never taken public speaking lesson courses. In fact, I speak way too much for public <laughs> speaking. Uh, 
but I, I acknowledged in the, the people before me that that was something they didn't do. And all of the crews, that's what they wanted. They said, Dr. Carney, we just want to hear from you. We just yeah. want a short five minute update, whatever it may be. We just want to know what's going on. We just want to know what's going on. And so, you know, I, I'm more comfortable in a public speaking position now than I was two or three years ago because of everything we've been through. But it's it's something that I acknowledge from the crews. They just want to hear mm -hmm. from administration. You and, just, and yeah. To be honest, we want to be heard. Yeah. Too. So and that, that and I, you do a good job of that too. Yeah. So I know yeah. I got a little stuff in my nose, but hey, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's you know, kind of going along with that is there's a lot of uncertainty, yeah. you know, yeah. we're just kind of running out, you know, running around out here going, okay, well, what's going on. Yeah. And then, you know, you hear this or you hear that. It's like, okay. Well, why don't, why don't somebody just tell us and be honest about it, yeah. you know, and then that way we can all figure out a way to move forward yeah. instead yeah. of, well, it'll be this. And then, Oh no, it'll be that. Or just say, Hey, we fucked up and now we're going a different direction. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the the comparison is whatever a patient's involved. You accidentally give the wrong medication or or the wrong procedure occurs. And they they try to talk you through that and tell you how you address that situation. I've unintentionally done the wrong thing here. I did not intend to give them the wrong medicine, but it's occurred. How do you address that with the patient and the family? And every single class and course on it is you just go have an open, honest conversation. Hey, this happened. I'm not going to deny that this happened. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of have an idea why it happened and different things we can put into place that would potentially prevent that from the future. But I've got to be honest with you, you know, this, mm -hmm. this, we accidentally gave them this medication instead of the other medication. They're going to be okay. We're going to take care of them, but this is what happened. That's what all of these courses have, have told people in medicine for years is, as you just, you do. Be honest. Yeah. Own your be shit. honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it humanizes you, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it takes you from this not understanding person on a pedestal and you sit down on the same level with people and Hey, this, this happened. We messed up. Well, it, it brings that the, the the doctor down to the human level yeah. instead of being kept on the on the pedestal where a lot of us put doctors. Yeah, you know I don't mean that in a bad way at all, but yeah. you know we all know those doctors that have they're just it, blah, 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 and leave. Yeah, you're like, hey man, I got questions. Yeah, <laughs> you know, hang on, go back yeah. here. Yeah, but because I, I, in the medicine thing, I almost did it the other day. I was gonna give Zofran. I just happened to look. I was like, oh, that's Benadryl, but they were so close in color yeah. when I grabbed it. I mean. And it was, they weren't separated. Yeah, yeah. So, well, and then, but shame on me for not double checking. That identifies before. system process issues that aren't usually identified otherwise. Benadryl and Zofran look very similar. Mm -hmm. Amio and Dextrose came in the same bag for a long time. You know, I'm trying to think of other examples. A narcotic and something else. Um, there, There's different packaging things that if I order it, I don't know that it came in a different package this month. Yeah. And so until somebody says, hey, Dr. Carney, this, this Benadryl looks just like the Zofran, it, it's impossible to make any system changes, you know. And the majority of those mistakes, it's called the Swiss cheese model. It's multiple slices of cheese lined up, and they all have holes in them. And it, it's the issue starts here, and if the issue can pass through every single hole, then you mm -hmm. you reach the patient and you have the bad outcome. And so you didn't intend to draw Benadryl, but with your muscle memory, it's you're getting yeah. the Benadryl because it's right by the Zofran or they're packaged the exact same. And then whenever that mistake happens, you think, oh my gosh, like, man, yeah, I, was, I, was mad at I really messed up. Yeah. A few hours. When in it. actuality, there's a whole Swiss cheese model behind that of system processes that should have protected you as the provider and so it's identifying for failure. it's identifying <laughs> a system issue yeah I, I feel a little better about it now but still i, I felt horrible i mean i know yeah. it, it wouldn't have done it it should have gotten sleepy but i didn't want to throw it up on me that's, that's the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> she's already nauseous i was like uh let's not puke on me because i'm gonna puke yeah but luckily i didn't i, I caught it before yeah. i gave it well when you talk about changing a culture or changing a response to focus on mental health 
it is in identifying self-reported issues and not having those lead to disciplinary action yeah. if they shouldn't, you know, it's, it's more about focusing on the system processes that are in place or not in place that led to that mistake reaching the patient. And so a lot of the response from a supervisor goes into your mental health. Like, hey, man, I accidentally messed up. I gave this instead of this. If you have a supervisor or a captain or somebody come down on you and call you an idiot and you're stupid, then that's how you're going to internalize that versus seeing the entire Swiss cheese model behind it. And so it, it is truly a huge um, working beast when it comes to how issues occur within fire EMS agencies. So. Yeah. Anytime there's a supply chain, yeah. like you said, yeah. there's potential for that type yeah. of stuff to happen. Yeah. So, and then and that's something that blue everybody... Because you got one that's Duke blue and one that's North Carolina blue. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them both. <laughs> He's a Duke fan. Don't lie. <laughs> uh, I Rock have chalk, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> Rock chalk. Well, I've got no comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me. Do you do you have any parting thoughts or anything? It's all going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. It's all going to be okay. <laughs> I think we're going to have Dr. Carney back on. <laughs> um, I would actually like that, yeah, if you'd be willing to come back sure, on. Sure, yeah. Do another episode. Yeah. That would be great. Unless next time we'll have food involved. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Maybe we can get James here and you can yeah. just rag on him. We are time. volunteering <laughs> James to cook a no. buffet. No. no. <laughs> oh, never mind. Maybe not. <laughs> Jeremy's yeah. going to make chili. Yeah. Nice. I'll, I'll oh, make I love chili. chili. So, all right. Well, everybody, thanks for stopping by. If you see somebody that's having a problem or if you are having a problem, reach out. There's help out there. You are never alone. There's always a way forward. Take care of yourself.